shaved with uh, oil this morning instead of huh. shaving cream. What kind of oil? Uh, just some like a some beard oil type stuff that yeah. I had. It's it did it did better. It looks pretty smooth. It did better. I don't know. Do you usually shave on Sunday mornings? Because it looks smoother than I'm used to. Not always. <sighs> okay. If I let my facial hair get much past, check check check. It's like it just makes my skin dry right here. I have no idea why. If I keep shaving, it's not there. It's Thank like it strips oil from my face. Interesting. So, Kyle, before we do anything, this uh, this is going to be our Christmas episode. Oh, I love Christmas. Because... <coughs> <laughs> because I'm wearing a red and green shirt? No, because... Um, well, I was going to... Well, first of all, I need to change the colors. We're going like Christmas colors? Christmas colors, yeah. Try to do... Red and green, if that's Christmas colors. Oh, man. And red under the table. So, if I would have stayed on schedule with editing, last week's episode should have been the Christmas episode because we really, I mean, we recorded on Sunday and then not the... Not five days later on Friday, but then one week after that is typically when the episode releases. So almost two weeks between recording and releasing. However, the shipping time was too slow, so I had to move uh, our, do? our Christmas episode to this week. So. <laughs> this guy got me a gift. I got his ugly Christmas sweaters to wear for the episode. Oh man, that one's yours. So, I love it. Soli Deo Gloria. Man, those are awesome. Because I knew you wouldn't want to wear the other one. This is this. Say? I got this one for me. This is my, my jolly, jolly face with Spurgeon. <laughs> it looks like you. <laughs> it's, it's Spurgeon. You look like Spurgeon. The other, the only other option was a. It was a picture of John Calvin, and it said, uh, "You're all on the naughty list." And I knew you wouldn't want to have Calvin on. Are here. we putting these on? Yeah, yeah. So we're. I'm gonna. So Merry Christmas to everybody. Thank uh, you. We hope you enjoy our Christmas episode. We probably won't talk about Christmas at all after this point. But We're talking about Jesus. If we do, then we do. I'm also sick or getting over a, a pretty good cold. So uh, I've got my radio voice going a little bit. <laughs> you ever seen Starsky and Hutch? The, uh, yes, the but new I don't remember one. much about it. There's a, it made me think of a a part in my radio voice. It made me think of a part from that show where he says, um, welcome to KPTP radio. This next tune is number eight on the charts, but number one in our hearts. Clues were left behind that suggested a mystery. And to many humans, a mystery is irresistible. Unless... I am convinced by scripture and by plain reason, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Long I pondered my king's cryptic talk of victory. I have a lot of things to ponder. All righty. <laughs> I've got some good uh, talking points for us today. Glory to God alone. Brother Kyle. I'm looking forward to this Christmas special. I think the only Christmas thing about it is I'm wearing this cool Christmas sweater. And the, the red and green. Oh, the red and green. Yeah. yeah. And it's week before Christmas. Those red lights make me think of uh, Darth Vader. Or Darth Maul. Darth Maul. Yeah. Darth, I think Darth Maul is the coolest Darth. I think so, too. I think he was... What well, he had that cool sword thing, or lightsaber that was... There you go. <laughs> that was double... Come out, Buzzy. Two-sided lightsaber, yeah. yeah. I don't know what that's called something. I don't know. 
there's an actual sword that exists like that, and that has a name, so I guess we could look that up. I'll put it on the screen. Thank you for this. Yeah, no problem. What a blessing. Kyle, do you know the difference between Catholics and Baptists? No. Catholics will wave at each other at the liquor store. <laughs> that is a good difference. Uh, so uh, this week, I was going to go to a seminar on prophe prophecy, but it was canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. Welcome to the first in our series on fake behaviors. Today's installment, Fake Laughs. <laughs> that, was a, that was a symbol clasher you know i just finished reading a book on post-millennialism <laughs> <laughs> the best part was the end oh mm. that is always the best part right i heard a joke today oh that's funny yes it was i have a new vacation desire a new uh, place where i'd like to go like for a vacation mm -hmm. an anechoic chamber in Memphis, Tennessee. So it's it's a place where it completely silent. It's it's like the most soundproof. It's the most silent place in the world, or one of them. Uh, there's a few of these in the U.S., but the closest one to us is in Memphis, Tennessee. And it is uh, it's completely silent in there. Apparently, nobody has lasted longer than forty three or forty five minutes in one of those chambers. It turns out this is really only true of one anechoic chamber in Minneapolis, Minnesota. People have lasted a lot longer in other anechoic chambers, and some of the stuff that I'm saying is not totally accurate, but interesting stuff. Just sitting silent, and sitting in the, you can You can make all the noise you want, but nobody has been able to last longer than 43 minutes. Apparently, if you go... Can't just go to sleep? That's eh, kind of cheating. Oh, okay. Yeah, but... Um, <clears throat> but, uh, well, actually... It'd probably be pretty difficult to go to sleep from what I've heard about him. So it's so quiet in there that you start to hear things like your heartbeat. Blood uh, rushing. Blood, yeah, your blood flowing through your stomach. They said you can even hear your lungs. So I would imagine like what a doctor hears when they put the stethoscope on your on your back and then hmm. tell you to breathe. So you can hear all of your bodily functions happening because there's no other sound. It's completely silent in there. But it's crazy to me that nobody has lasted longer than... I think it's 43 minutes. It might be 45. I'd like to give that a whirl. Yeah. It's crazy to me that nobody's ever lasted longer than that. I think I could go for hours. I mean, you just... I th it sounds like amazing to me. It sounds like it would be great. It's kind of like those sim sensory deprivation tanks. Yeah. I wonder if... Because of all the silence, if you almost lose track of time and you think you've been in there for hours and you've been in there for 43 minutes. There's probably an element to that, yeah. I would think, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, man, I've been gone for days. Kind of like the line, the witch in the wardrobe. Yeah, but they say um, they say after a certain amount of time, you start to hallucinate and like hear, audit, auditorily hallucinate. Did I say that right? You start to have auditorily. You start to, you start to have auditory hallucinations. Huh. Which is which is crazy to think about, but it, I mean, it seems like you could just go sit in there and. Um, Did they just make one? You make this thing? No, there. So there's, I think there's three of them in the United States. There's a lot. It, they probably cost millions of dollars to build, but it's like these things that we've got here for sound. Imagine a room completely covered, like twelve inches of concrete, and then some kind of sound deadening sheetrock, and then that stuff the highest quality of that stuff just completely surrounding there's no it's it's literally silent like whenever you whenever here in this room or in any room whenever we talk it bounces the sound waves bounce off multiple times and then get back to us and that kind of thing it doesn't there's no sound like on there's there's how much it cost to get in this thing i don't know i haven't researched all that but uh and well i tried on their web on the it's at the university of memphis huh in Tennessee and it's not kind of it's not really something that they rent out like they use it for research and and uh testing different audio equipment and that kind of thing but it'd be kind of cool I thought it'd be I'd really like fun to try it. there's videos of people so like if we're in that room I'm videotaping you you're facing me if you were to just make a constant noise mm, and look at me and then constantly make the noise and do a complete circle when you're facing the other way the camera picks up almost no sound from you at all because it doesn't bounce off the wall and come back to me. It just uh, completely absorbs into the wall. It's, I mean, it's anechoic chamber. Just, anechoic just, chamber. Yeah, just look up an anechoic chamber. and, and you spell um, it. A-N-E. 
Coic, C H O I C. Anechoic chamber. Big news in the Catholic world. I saw a news article. This was released December 11th, 2023. Vatican City, the Catholic Church announced this week Pope Francis has excommunicated the Apostle Paul over the latter's outdated view on women, families, and social issues. We regret, this is a quote from the, from, uh, the Pope, we regret to announce St. Paul is no longer a member of the Catholic Church. A statement from the Vatican reads, Paul's pro- problematic teachings on so-called traditional families and women have no place in modern Catholicism. That's an article straight from the Babylon Bee. Oh, that's not real. <laughs> no. No, it goes on. It's pretty funny. Uh, like, what? You you look genuinely concerned. I, like, I looked is, up. This is the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It said something about Peter, too. Peter Where is and it? Paul and Mary. Where is it? It had something. It says, we regret we placed this deeply misogynistic and homophobic man on a pedestal for 2,000 years, said Francis to reporters, forbidding women from preaching, condemning homosexuality, telling women to be chaste, modest, and quiet in church. I'm literally shaking just thinking about it. Paul's continued defiance of modern Catholic sensibilities will no longer be allowed. (laughs) At publishing time, the Pope had announced an additional inquiry against St. Peter on the Apostles' continued insistence that people repent from their sins. (laughs) Man, the Babylon B is can be pretty savage sometimes. Man, That's, <laughs> you know how many people will read those first three lines and just post it on Facebook, not yeah. reading on, say, Joe. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. At this point, you got to know any anything from the Babylon B is a joke. They're funny. They're pretty funny. They have a podcast. I've listened to it a couple of times. You have a pair of underwear or something on there. What it's is a, that? It's a diaper. It's, Why do you um, have a diaper? Why are you looking at diapers? What what's your goal here? Why are you trying to make me look bad? No, I just saw batteries and diapers, and then Lay's potato <laughs> chips, cigarettes, and some type of milk. See, milk. See that? <laughs> uh, well, I haven't gotten to there yet. Sorry, I was going to get there, but uh, it says how long? I'll I'll put this on the screen. It says how long until it breaks down? So how long until it decomposes? It takes Lay's potato chips, or the the bag, 80 years. It takes a cigarette, 8 to 12 years to decompose. It takes a carton of milk, 5 years. It takes a diaper, apparently, 450 years. It takes a battery, 100 years to decompose. And it takes Armenian soteriology, 9 chapters. <laughs> oh. hmm. Fake laughs. That's funny. That was a... Uh... Way to kill that joke. Sorry. Sorry, I just saw the diaper and I was wondering what you were looking at diapers for. For whatever reason, episode 11, uh-huh. which is titled Spiritual Ramblings, is our highest episode by far. Really? Mm-hmm. It, I don't know why. I don't know if people see the title Spiritual Ramblings. I put Spiritual Ramblings because I couldn't couldn't think of anything to title it. We just, we were, we'd never, we didn't stick on a topic for longer than like two or three minutes, I think. And, um... I you did a lot of the talking. I was still really, really shy, camera shy, and I guess microphone shy. And so I didn't really talk a whole lot. Luckily, you had plenty to say, and so it kind of it didn't seem like we were struggling. So those analytics, <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, where did those analytics come from? Like Google or something? Uh, no, the we I use uh, Spotify for podcasters to to uh, distribute the podcast. Gotcha. So they come through them. 936 views as of today, which isn't a whole lot. On spiritual ramblings? Mm-hmm. Which isn't a whole lot, but it is almost three times the amount of number two. Why, well, when I was looking at the scripture just now mm-hmm. in Matthew chapter 6, and when you fart, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. Pray. Fast. When you fast. Yeah, I saw fart instead of fast. For they disguise their faces that their farting may be seen by others, smelled by others. Music. Rhyme Rhyme of the week. Rhyme of the... Dude, you got to (laughs) stop. I'm going to need to do this. Show me your card. That's why I quit sending you these notes beforehand, because last time you printed it out, it looked like on a poster board and brought it. (laughs) Everybody look at this. (laughs) There's no secrets. So that's not going to work. (laughs) Here, I'll stop looking at it. Um, stop saying it out loud. So I was looking at uh, 1 Samuel 16, 23. I thought this was an interesting thing with music. 
or an interesting because uh, music is something that I, I really enjoy. Um, Rhymes of the Remnant is a is a playlist that I've spent some time building with a, in a with a purpose, an important purpose behind it. Say sixteen twenty three. Yes, sir. First Samuel sixteen twenty three which says, Thus it happened that whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand, and Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. So music music has some... Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't even know how to say it, but music has got um, some significance to it. There's something, the way it affects humans, there's something to it. What do you think? I've heard this several times, and I don't, I can't go to an exact scripture. I think that there's some things in Ezekiel where a lot of people say that Lucifer was heaven's choir master. Mm-hmm. You know, with the way that he's described in Ezekiel with the whatever you call it. What chapter is that? Thir- like 36? Yeah, it's in the 30s. Visions of Valley, here's at 39. Prophecy against Gog, invaders destroyed. That sounds sounds, sounds like cool. a movie title. <laughs> Gog. <laughs> Prophecy against Gog, invaders destroyed. <laughs> More over the word of the Lord, 2811. More over the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You are an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you are filled with violence in your midst and your sin it, and you sin. So I cast you a profane thing from the mountain of God. And I destroyed, O guardian chair, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you by the multitudes of your iniquities. This is not. Yeah, kind of. I mean, and I, I, I know what you're talking about. You know, I've heard but, that but, said, but you? that's what I that's what I thought of whenever you mentioned what you did. Yeah, that's what I thought of. Um, I've heard it. That's it's kind of debated if that can be applied to Satan or not because there was an actual king of Tyre, right? But um, yeah, many, many, many theologians believe it is. Right? Yeah, I think in the King James version, it describes the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes timbrels was and prepared pipes. for you on the day you were created. He can sing. He's got some pipes. Got that pipe, baby. So, Kyle, you sent me a video of this week that was really, really interesting. I responded to it. Like I said, oh, that's a cool video. Before I watched the whole thing, I was like five minutes into it when I responded. So the response didn't have a lot of a lot of uh, content. However, after watching the video, I, it made me think of a lot of things. So the, the one with Shia Lynn, <clears throat> where he talks about the history of Christian hip-hop. I just thought it was kind of cool. It, it it was. It was very cool. So I've got some stuff to say about it. So Ichabod, let's go to 1 Samuel 4. Do you ever do the, what are those called? Uh, the drills, something drills. Bible drills. Bible drills. Sword drills. Sword drills. That's what it was when you try to get, mm-hmm. I hate it. That was always so much pressure. I hated that. So 1 Samuel 4.21. Ichabod. Yeah. So it says, and she called the boy. Uh, well, let's go up a uh, verse, verse 20. And about that time, her, and about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, "Do not be afraid, for you have given birth to a son." But she did not answer or pay attention, and she called the boy Ichabod, saying, "The glory of God has departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband." So Ichabod uh, basically means no glory. I think that's what the footnote says for the. For Ichabod, the word Ichabod, basically no glory. Sola uh, no gloria? What? Sola no gloria? Sola no gloria. Only only no glory? My guess, Ichabod. Okay. So Ichabod. Now, Shailen has a song called Ichabod. 
the well, it's a call of the song itself is a call of repentance to Christian hip hop to to the rappers of Christian hip hop, uh, and the the um, so this is the rhyme of the week, which is something I wanted to start doing. Rhymes of the remnant, I made it because uh, Philippians four eight think about these things. Uh, so I thought I'll do a rhyme of the week where let's just like as I listen to it throughout the week, if there's cool. a if there's a line that pops in. I like it. Makes me think of something. I'll bring it. So this is the one for this week. Uh, the chorus, uh, or the hook, of Ichabod by Shailen says, Christian hip-hop got me feeling brokenhearted. We're such a long way off from where we started. We think we're winning, but Satan has got us outsmarted. I wonder if the glory of God has departed. Help us before you choose a different squad. We need to repent or else we might get the rod. I can't call it. It seems like we're sick of God. What do you call that, huh, Ichabod? So he kind of... Hmm. Uh, he's he's calling out Christian hip hop in general because they got away from Christian or uh, Christ centered lyrics, which he even mentions in a couple other songs. Um, so in Random Thoughts, which was like two thousand four, two thousand six, something, he starts the song off with, uh, "Hey yo, I'm back, but nobody was asking where I'd been. Uh, I'm back, but nobody was asking where I'd been. Let me chime in. I go by the name of." Shaolin. Never mind. He says never mind because he's then like the nameless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he came, uh, Random Thoughts 3 came out years later and he says, Hey, yo, I'm back, but nobody was asking where I'd been. Let me chime in. Um, or, Hey, yo, I'm back, but nobody was asking where I'd been because Christ centered music is no longer the hot trend. So this was kind of a, a, uh, a recurring theme in his music. But then at the end, of the song is the quote from Paul Washer that he played in that video, the warning that Paul Washer gave. So this was at uh, the Christian hip hop artist uh, at the Legacy Conference in 2007. Uh, Paul Washer says, the art form you're doing here, what is it known for in the world? It's known for sin and immorality. It is known to be vile and cause destruction. But yesterday and today, I saw the same thing happen to a music form that has happened to my life. God has taken it, cleaned it off, made it new, and filled it with life. But let me give you a warning. And so again, this was 2007. By Paul Washer. Mm -hmm. At the Legacy Conference. C correct. But let me give you a warning that's very important. As a preacher, I know this. Whenever eloquence is more important than the words spoken, there is no power. And whenever a music medium becomes more important than the truth it seeks to commun communicate, it's useless. And when Shia Lin talked about that in that video that you sent, he plays that warning again. Uh -huh. And that video took place in 2019, I think. Yeah, just a couple years ago. Yeah, two, somewhere between 19 and 22. <clears throat> he said, he played that quote, and whenever he was introducing the, the audio clip of it, he said, uh, and this warning, which turned out to be very prophetic. Um. But yeah, so that was that was a really really cool video to watch. I didn't. Uh... Yeah, I was actually searching for. Honestly, I was searching for hymns for our worship services, and that came up. I can't remember. It was like Christy and Getty or something like that. Keith, Keith and Kristen Getty. Kristen, there. Uh... It was on their yeah YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and I was just kind of looking through their stuff because I was looking for lyric videos because they got a lot of really good live stuff, but with no lyrics, right. And when we do worship over in the main sanctuary, it's <clears throat> you almost have to have lyrics or people aren't going to know the songs. Yeah, yeah, you have to. Yeah, have yeah. lyrics. Is that all? Yeah, I and it was it. just kind of. I thought it was an interesting find. I, I like it mm -hmm. when I stumble across things when I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for something else and stumble across something good. So Kristen Getty, uh, she is the voice of the ESV Audio Bible. Oh, really? She has, a, cool she has a beautiful voice, and she's from Northern Ireland. Her accent's awesome. So, for since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Faith. Yeah. I love that accent. I like the way she says faith. <laughs> yeah. I almost was like, is she saying faith? <laughs> yeah, she is. Um, but yeah, so she, her and her husband, they do, uh, they do a lot of hymns and stuff. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, I really like their music. They're really good singers. There's, there's, they've got a few songs on the doxology 
al- uh, playlist that I've made. Yeah, I like them. Uh, Reawaken Hymns, I think they do a good job. I like his. He kind of goes a little slower than I would like at times. That and there's no variation. It's yeah, it's all the same. It's all yeah. He's very good, very talented, but it it, it there's not yeah. a lot of variation in it, unfortunately. I think that like hymnals, the way that people used to do hymnals, they were on the back of the pew. Mm-hmm. I remember that clearly when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, I even do too. Well, and there was there was no overhead projector or anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, overhead projectors and stuff like that. They, I mean, that was way later. We're in the modern era. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same mm-hmm. time, I think that with we have the technology, a hymnal, it really seems that the hymns that were in hymnals mm-hmm. or the hymns in general, and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to move us to a more theologically correct <clears throat> form of, of worship mm-hmm. in, in a congregational setting. Yeah. And I do appreciate that. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's tough for people sometimes if they're not used to that to, it's like, man, this, they're, cause they're so used to what's played on Christian radio. Are you talking about the content of the song or the like singing from a hymnal they're not used to or both? Yeah. Or just kind of singing in that style. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that singing in that style is so, has become so foreign. It's been so far removed that it's yeah. foreign to mm-hmm. us now. And I think that we can we can try to reintroduce that and bring that back. And I think that it will probably be necessary at some point in time because there's no sense in really saying it's worship if it's not glorifying God. Yeah, there's a difference between just Christian music and yeah. and and worship. Worship it, to me is its own category, uh, sub sub genre, I'll say, of, of Christian music. But um, sovereign grace music. Mm-hmm. They're, they do a really good job, I think, at, at taking that old style that you're talking about and kind of making it modern a little bit, uh, making it a little more palatable for, for younger Christians or, or just people who aren't used to hymns. And just trying to find songs that some of the older generations, they may know them from memory, Blessed Assurance, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> Alan Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> you know, How Great Thou Art, yeah. some of those some of those hymnals, if we can kind of reintroduce those <clears throat> with somebody other than Alan Jackson, mm-hmm. Alan Jackson, I, I, I can, I can sing to Alan Jackson. I can, mm-hmm. I may not sound just like him, but I kind of know the rhythm yeah, of yeah. it. And with some of these, it's hard to keep rhythm because they're so foreign. It's almost like you got to play them over and over and over and over and over again. Well, yeah, they're, they're, so a lot of music today is just in four, four time, just one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But um, a lot of those hymns and stuff were like three, four time, or or those are the only two I know currently. But but they're they're in different time. Uh, what's that word? Time, 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 time. I can't remember. tempo. Or? No tempo is just the speed of it. Mm-hmm. But the like one, two, three, one, two instead of one, two, three, four. There's different. I got um, you. Yeah, I don't know. There's a word. I'll put the word on the screen. I, honestly, I don't know hardly anything about music as far as that, like mm-hmm. music theory type stuff. I yeah. know, I'm, I I know the bare minimum. Just I know way less than that. What I what I learned from seventh and half of eighth grade band being in the in percussion and mm-hmm. band, yeah. Um, but I actually bought a while back. I bought a Baptist hymnal um, to get to find songs to yeah. to make lyric videos and stuff. Um, it's difficult to find audio, good audio of these songs um, because a lot of the like a lot of the things that I find it's like a church singing it, and so they didn't go into a recording studio and try to make music. Right. Uh, they just videotaped a church singing it. But um, something I thought was really interesting about it, I didn't know this about hymnals, but it's it's um, organized into theological topics. So it so there's the I, grace of God. I or, should have had it, but yeah. So like it. So there's uh, there's more than this, but three of the divisions are God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. And then within each of those, there are, are subcategories. So God, the father, his mercy, God, the father, his justice, God, the father, his grace, and then God, the son, his, um, what's it called? What do they call it? Whenever he, his, whenever he came the first time, his two incarnation. No, well that, but, um, there's a word for it. Whenever he come, his first, something and then a second something appearing no there's like a oh what's that called i gotta remember it his 
I wonder if I can find it. But anyway. Visitation? No. Uh, Christ's first and second. Advent is Advent. Advent. Yeah. I mean, Christmas special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I had to find it. So, yeah, his it, it talks about his first Advent and then his yes. suffering and his sacrifice and then his glory. And so it, it's the songs are divided out. What do you want to sing about today? What attribute of God or what theological topic do you want to sing about today? <clears throat> I like that, especially if it could tie into whatever the message is going to be. If we could tie those together, I think that it kind of sets the stage. Mm -hmm. I I think that that could be something that could help us. Right. Yeah, I think think so, too. It's it's very intentional. I have a recommendation. Okay. Totally switching gears here. I have a recommendation for everybody. Okay. Chirp Audiobooks. Yeah, check it out. C-H-I-R-P. Chirp, chirp. Chirp, chirp. I got... 21 or 22 audiobooks for seven dollars and i think 49 cents that is a good deal which is crazy because some you just put them on your phone yeah so there's there's a there's a chirp app but you can't go on the store on the app you have to go on their website and then you uh, buy audiobooks and then they appear in your app and you can download them and that kind of thing um but it's a free app. It's so much better than than Audible because I think Audible now you have to subscribe. You have yeah. to do a monthly subscription. Some of them can be expensive too. Yeah, they're it's like new audiobooks are twenty five bucks and up, and I got twenty two of them for seven fifty. Uh, That's a great deal. It's like Timu for audiobooks. What's that? Timu. Yeah. You know, checked out Timu. Timu is an app that you can buy stuff at super cheap mm. rates, like seventy, eighty, ninety percent off. Yeah, yeah, and that's like a, they were having a sale. But a bunch of those books are free. Um, that was why it was so cheap because a lot of the majority of those books were free. So, and they were really, really good audiobooks. So, uh, I started reading a book called The Foundations of Grace by Stephen Lawson, which talks about. Did you get it off chart? No. Uh, I actually have the print copy of this book. Yeah. And now, uh, just a, a little sidebar for Go me. ahead. Go ahead. <clears throat> when you say I'm reading a book, I automatically go to you have a physical book that you're reading. But yes. a lot of times people will say, I'm reading a book and they're listening to an audio book. I can't in good conscience say that. I, I can't either. I, I differentiate. I, I, I say I, I'm listening to a book. I automatically <clears throat> assume you have an actual piece of paper. Yeah. And that whenever I say I'm reading a book. You're reading a book. If I don't specify it's a Kindle version on my phone or it's an audio book, I'm talking about a print book. Okay. Um, yeah, because I can't in good conscience say <laughs> I'm, I'm a liar. I'm reading a book, yeah. But uh, so I'm, I'm, I've started reading a book called The Foundations of Grace by Stephen Lawson, and it talks about good theology, um, basically the the doctrines of grace. And he starts with Jesus and Paul and Peter and follows it all the way down through church history up to today with like R.C. Sproul and John Piper and John MacArthur and, and himself. Um, but there's a section in the book where he outlines uh, influential, uh, I think he calls them church fathers throughout all of history, starting oh. starting with Christ. I bet that's good. And so the picture that I sent you about Log College, mm-hmm. the green highlights were uh, all of the authors. So there's like 50 authors from all different points in church history. Start again, starting in 1 AD all the way through 2023, 2022, I think it was released. Um, so I went through on Chirp and searched every single one of those authors and that's found so books, yeah man. yeah so it i mean uh, i think the earliest one i found it was before the reformers i think um the reformers were in the 15s and 1600s um but it was before that but it's i mean it's got people from you know the early church fathers 300 AD 200 AD that kind of thing you're getting into some you're getting some early, early folks. Oh, yeah. And then it's got like a whole section on the Puritans and uh, and then the Reformers. And it's so, yeah, it was like a gold mine of good authors, like like sound, sound biblical authors that you can. And it, it wasn't I love only, stuff like that. It wasn't only authors. It was like uh, um, missionaries and pastors and teachers and that kind of thing. But yeah, so it was that was where I, all those books that I got were were around, authors from, were based on what Stephen Lawson in his book, you'd kind of find those as far mm-hmm. as church fathers and authors that were. Yeah. Cause it's hard to like today, if it's not a pastor that I've heard his teaching before, uh-huh. like if I find an author and it's not a pastor, I've heard his teaching. It's hard to, without just going in and reading the book, which is a, is a time investment. It's hard to know if you can trust him or not. Cause there's a lot of wolves out there. 
Oh, there is, man. I was just kind of, for some reason, I've been on the vein of biblical giving. Mm -hmm. And there are so many different teachings over biblical giving Mm -hmm. that I think you have to be a little bit watchful and you have to have an open Bible while while studying that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just going to fall in line with whatever that person's teaching. And I think that that's why it's important to have good, trusted teachers that you know are not wolves in sheep clothing because they're out there. Did you listen to that song I sent you, by the way, on that? The Give yes. It Up? Yeah. I love that song. It's such a good song. Give it up. Consider what the Father has given us. In His Son, every spiritual blessing, and we live it up. Yeah, it was good. I love that. I like the way it sounds. It's just yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Uh, he's a he's a good he's one on a lyricist. He's rhymes, on the rhymes, rhymes of the remnant. the remnant. So Juan, I showed that uh, Juan Huerta, Juan Huerta, Juan Leon Huerta, my good old buddy. Um, we crash into Colossians. Yeah, we're going to Col- go to Colossians too. That's my next point. I'm not there quite yet, but uh, no, I did it again. No, that's okay. You, uh, I, I just showed my hand. Uh, <laughs> so he was when we were talking one night in plumbing school. He was like, uh, he asked me what kind of music I like, and I was like, all oh, rap. I love rap. And he was like, man, I like rap too, but it's hard to find good biblical rap. Did you share the rhymes? And I was that? like, oh, no, I have it's a, not I, for I have you a, I have a present for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I should, and he, he uh, came back the next week and was like, man, I've been listening to Rhymes of the Remnant, just kind of slowly going through it. And he's, it's some really good stuff. So he's uh, his on his dad's side. I believe it's his dad's side. He's half white, half Mexican. On his dad's side, I think he's, he's Mexican. His, his Spanish is okay. He says it's not good, uh, not perfect. Uh, but he, one of the songs in Spanish came up with from Rubinsky RBK. You know, Latino Americana, uno song y no será más menospreciada para el mundo desde República Dominicana, la capital del jefe cristiano en habla hispana. And he, I think Rubinsky RBK, this is the way I described him. It's like if Tupac was a Christian born in the Dominican Republic. That's what um, his I, th- I love his style it's it's very lyric heavy the beat is there just to keep the tempo and kind of sound good in the background but it's all about the lyrics and his songs and uh, i really love that style my brother it, before he died he he i thought you were calling him my brother <laughs> no my brother before he died he just bootleg music and, <laughs> and movies that's what he did to make extra money oh really oh, oh yeah. like he sold him i thought you oh, yeah. he just like bootleg. <laughs> um yeah so he did that i mean he made he made I mean, he made money every week. I mean, he'd sell them pretty cheap, but at yeah. the same time, it'd be a brand new movie, and he'd just kind of rip them from the web. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, he was a kid in a, you know, 35-year-old kid with muscular dystrophy in a wheelchair that, you know, could move his thumb and had a sharp brain, so he just used a computer all the time. So what are they going to do to him? You know, it's uh, he he didn't live in fear of the cops ever coming to bust me. He says, what are they going to do to me? FBI has no mercy, yeah. man. But he, uh, for a long period of time, SPM. What's that? He's a he's a Mexican. He's a Hispanic rapper. Mm. I'm SPM. Is you he Mexican? Know my name. I'm the one that came about the dope game. Yeah, he's Mexican. He talked about smoking weed a lot. Mm. But yeah, I don't know that you need to check him out. But he had a kind of a cool flow to him. Yeah. So those guys have great flow, <laughs> mm-hmm. and their lyrics may not be super. But that's when you see somebody else kind of still in their flow and putting it with a better lyric. Yeah. And and that I mean, that's kind of what Shylin talked about in that video was um, the birth of Christian hip hop and like the roots of it. He went all the way back to like the 70s. And the and, he's, he studied it. I mean, he yeah. knows mm-hmm. way more than me. So moving on to uh, Colossians 2. This was a topic that came up, uh, I think, two weeks ago when Mike was on. The difference, I wanted to clarify the difference between justification and being made alive. Okay. Because I think there are two things that happen simultaneously, but they are two distinct things. Okay. So Colossians 2, 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him and having forgiven us all of our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So you were were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, and he made you alive together with him, 
And the thing that caused that to happen was having forgiven all your transgressions, he canceled out the certificate of debt. So I, th- I think I wanted to clarify because we that was kind of it wasn't the main thing that we were talking about, and I, in my head it kind of stayed a little bit unclear. But I think justification is the legal standing before God, and it happens simultaneously uh, with being made alive spiritually. But they're two distinct things that happen: we're made alive and we're justified. Uh, but being being made alive is not being justified. They're two distinct things. Does that make sense? What are your What are your thoughts? Ponder. Being made alive. Repeat your last statement. So basically, being made alive spiritually and justification are two things that happen simultaneously. Whenever God removes the heart of stone, gives you a heart of flesh, and opens your eyes to see the truth, to uh, gives you the ability to love Christ. And to repent of your sins gives you the gift gift of faith and the gift of repentance. You are you are both made alive and justified at the same time, but they are two distinct uh, work or two distinct changes that happen. Recanting of anything that I said last week due to the fact that I'm not a hundred percent clear on everything in the Bible, mm-hmm. and if I said something incorrectly, then I recant. I plead the fifth. (laughs) So once we've been given the gift of faith, Mm -hmm. we're made spiritually alive. Our spirit is reborn. Mm -hmm. I think in that moment, we've been given the gift of eternal life. Mm -hmm. I think once the spirit's born, it's for lack of better term, and I may be wrong here. It's immortal. I would agree. Okay, so I'm the the immortality of the spirit is once the spirit has been reborn by God the Father alone, giving us the gift of faith. Yeah, and I would I would throw in um, unbelievers also have some immortality some some form of immortality because they will live eternally in hell they're 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 spiritually dead but um there's a there's a false i believe it to be a false teaching that believers will live eternally in heaven with god and unbelievers will just basically like yeah that's called annihilationism correct i think it came by like arthur pink and a couple of other people that Mm -hmm. kind of brought that in i don't i cannot i cannot make that make sense in light of scripture that you're annihilated yeah I think that the difference is eternal separation from God is death. Yeah, yeah. Because I think Zoe is life, Mm -hmm. and you only get Zoe through being connected to God. Mm -hmm. But justification, and I may be wrong here, so it's just like I'm totally open to pondering the pages, and it may take more than just this episode. Mm -hmm. Justification is a legal term. And I don't know if justification happens prior to repentance. Um, because I think repentance is required for justification to transpire. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So I think that faith comes before repentance. So you're made spiritually alive, given the gift of faith. And it. when you're made spiritually alive, your eyes are opened and blessed are the poor in spirit and it leads us to (laughs) repentance. And then when we repent, we are justified. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that order. Um, I would say they all happen almost simultaneously. Almost simultaneously. Yeah. Like uh, split second. I mean, yeah, just think that God works first, Mm -hmm. which leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's where almost the irresistible part happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you, you can't repent until you're made alive. Yeah, right. And then I would, I would agree. I think you're justified. You're given eyes to see and ears to hear as soon as you're made spiritually alive. Mm-hmm. And then you're, when, you, when you see a holy God and you're given spiritual rebirth, mm-hmm. You're going to say, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think you're going to say, I'm sorry. Yeah, because you recognize, 
I've sinned against uh, the holy creator. As uh, I think Shailen says this, a few people say this, cosmic treason. I think John Piper actually said that. Cosmic treason. You you recognize you've committed cosmic treason. And, uh, yeah. and you say you're sorry. Where are you going? I'm, looking, I'm just looking at the word justify. Um, and trying to see, seeking to be justified. These, he also, Romans 8. Let's go to Romans 8. Uh, start in verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. So that doesn't really speak a whole lot into the difference between justification and being made alive. But I, th I think it's a uh, this kind of focus zooms in and focuses on the justification aspect where who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. They're they're declared innocent. We can now stand before a holy God and not be <laughs> destroyed um, because we're, just, we're we're declared innocent. Christ's righteousness is imputed to us, um, but that can't happen until we're made alive. Being made alive, I would say, being made alive is a prerequisite to being justified. But I think I think they happen like uh, nearly simultaneously. I think they're they're split second. It's not like a month later, you know. Yeah, I mean, I I definitely think that I think that repentance repentance has to happen before justification happens in my own mind. Yeah, I agree. And I think that you will only repent if you've been given faith to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Mm -hmm. And that only comes, that's a, that's a free gift given to us by the father. You can't, you, know, you can't, you, you can't muster it up. Well, yeah. I would, yeah. And I would also add, you don't, nobody wants to, nobody, nobody who has not been convinced of their sin by the Holy spirit seeks to seeks after God or seeks to repent. Um, I was talking to somebody this week who um, he was he was basically just talking around talking about sleeping around with different women, and uh, I was like, man, you got to repent. Basically, we've we've worked together for a long time, and so it's there's not like tiptoeing. It, we yeah, can just be you, you can know. just talk. And uh, <clears throat> so I was like, man, that's sinful. You got to you got to repent of that sin. You got to. And he's like, ah, oh, that's not a sin. And I was like, he he's. <laughs> he has the most perverted understanding of scripture I've ever heard, I think. But, he, but he, uh, I was like, well, what does, is, what does scripture say? And he's like, until I'm married, I can, and he, I'll, uh, I'll let you yeah. assume what he said, but basically until I'm Don't married. Don't mess my tutu. <laughs> but yeah, it basically said until I'm married, I can basically sleep with whoever I want. Because, huh. And, uh, but, and I was like, well, sleeping around, that's adultery. Or I think I might've been wrong on that semantically i think definitely fornication fornication yeah but but um, sexual immorality sexual immorality yeah and, and um uh but anyway where was i going with that um oh yeah, yeah yeah so he he is completely convinced unless he's like in denial or he's just trying to make himself feel okay but i i believe that he is fully convinced that what he's doing is not sin and therefore feels zero need to repent of it. And I, I think that's given over to a reprobate mind over that particular subject. And I, I think uh, I think that's the state that everyone is in. They're convinced that what they do is not sin. Therefore, they don't need to repent of it until the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin. That's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit in this world. That's what Jesus said was he will come and, and convict the world of sin. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that people who are justified can willfully be in obedience for a long period of time that they stop asking for forgiveness over a particular sin. You mean disobedience? You yeah. Said, you said obedience. Yeah, disobedience. Mm -hmm. That they walk in that for a long period of time. 
and they don't have any similitude or evidence of, of fruit in their life in, in this. But if if they were called, if they were justified in some future moment, the Holy Spirit will convict them of their sin. They will ask for forgiveness, and they will be back on the road to sanctification. Mm-hmm. I just, if they were truly justified, I just don't think that. I just cannot see in light of scripture Mm -hmm. that somebody can be justified in court and then be unjustified. I just, I mean, it's double jeopardy. I mean, well, it's just like, I mean, we can use that term, um, but he, because Christ was convicted. I'll say it that way. Christ was convicted for, for, for our, yeah, to, to stay in the legal side. Christ was convicted of our crimes. He and and we were not. So those crimes, they've there's there a rule has been made on them. He paid the price. He 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 did the time, and so for us to receive the justification, we're now declared innocent. Our time is served by him. To to be convicted a second time of those crimes is that's double jeopardy in that. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a. It doesn't say that in scripture. That's a, a yeah. worldly example, but you get I it. get it though. I mean, I think convicted of convicted our crimes. It, yes, I mean, it's just like convicted. It's just like okay, all of the crimes of humanity are going to lay on you, mm-hmm. and the wages of sin is death. He died, so the punishment was met out. God's wrath poured out on Jesus. And because he had never sinned, but just took on the sins, just like just like in the animal sacrifices, that little sheep that they brought that was blemish free had never had never done any sin. Right. And then they laid their hands on it. The priests laid their hands on it, basically imputing the sins of the Jewish people onto that sheep. And then they slit its throat poured its blood out on the altar and the sins of the Jewish people were forgiven for a year. Mm -hmm. And they had to do that every year. And there was other sacrifices throughout the year too, I think. But I mean, that's, that's what happened to Jesus. He was the blemish free spotless lamb of God. All of our sins were laid on him. He was for his throat wasn't cut, but he hung on a tree. Mm Mm-hmm or hung on a cross, however you want to say it. But God, the Father, because of Jesus' sinless life for 33 years, prior to all the sins of the world being laid on him as the Passover sacrifice, accepted his sacrifice and rose him from the dead Mm -hmm. because of his obedience prior to the sins of humanity being laid on him. There's a song I'm trying to find. I can't, I'm not sure which one it is, Uh, but it plays a quote from Piper or John Piper, where he says, um, um, basically Christ did more in three hours than any sinner could have. And and it Christ accomplished more in three hours than any sinner could have for eternity in hell. Because, because the, the cost of our sins, the, the payment due for our sins is eternity in hell. Eternity does not end. Eternity goes on yeah. forever. And, it, and Christ accomplished in three hours what more than any sinner ever could have in hell. Um, yeah. But there, it's a, I wish I could find it. But the way Piper says it, I'll, I'll try to find it and I'll roll the clip. Um, roll that beautiful bean footage. <laughs> but, uh, um, but the way he says it. How could one man? He and then he. I can't remember. He does have it. He, I he's love, leaning on the podium. I love Piper so much. Chapter two, verse fifteen. You shine like lights in a dark world. I'd love to unpack the connection between those two texts, as well as chapter four, verse four, where you're not anxious for anything, as you let your gentleness be known to the world. This is all over the place in Philippians and in the new testament but we'll we'll just stay here he uh, piper really is to me i see him as like a mentor like i've i feel close yeah. i've never met him but I've, i feel close to him 
Uh, like he really is like a like a mentor to me. Um, he makes me think what the Apostle Paul would have looked like. Yeah, you think? Probably. Wasn't Paul Middle Eastern? Piper's pretty white. Yeah, but I mean, it's like it kind of alludes to in some historical documents that he was bald headed, big nose, <laughs> ugly, not much to look at. Man, I wish I could find that song. Is it this one? How can one man? That's it. In a matter of hours, drain the cup of God's wrath that would have taken an eternity to pour out on me. How can that be? That be? That be? So that's Timothy Brindle, uh, The Humility of Christ, but yeah, that, that quote at the beginning. How can one man? In a matter of hours. How can one man? <laughs> I love, uh, Sounds like a movie. Clip. I love John Piper. How Amazing can thing. one man? Oh, man. So last point. All right. <clears throat> a bit of a long one. I got some uh, quotes. This is from um, The Foundations of Grace by Stephen Lawson. Um, so when Adam and Eve sinned, their innocence is lost. They're ridden with guilt. And their first reaction is to notice that they're naked and to cover that up. I thought that was an interesting thing that the first thing they noticed was that they were naked and, uh, they wanted to cover that. So here's a quote from the foundations of grace by Stephen Lawson. Shame instantly darkened the souls of the first couple and made them want to hide from God. A sense of defilement troubled their consciences Hughes explains, the word guilt expresses the relation which sin bears to justice, or as the older theologians put it, to the penalty of the law. He who is guilty stands in a penal relation to the law. The guilt of Adam's sin committed by him as the federal head of the human race is imputed to all his descendants. This is evident from the fact that, as the Bible teaches, death as the, <clears throat> death as the punishment of sin passes on from Adam to all his descendants. Their eyes were open to an experimental understanding of sin. Their hearts were filled with the awareness of pollution. Such was the devastation of sin. Describing this new sense of inward guilt, Barnes writes, As soon as the transgression is actually over, the sense of wrongfulness and the act of the act rushes on the mind. The displeasure of the great being whose command has been disobeyed, the irretrievable loss which follows sin, the shame of being looked upon by the bystanders of a guilty thing crowd upon the view. All nature, every single creature, seems now a witness of their guilt and shame, a condemning judge, an agent of the divine vengeance. Such is the knowledge of good and evil they have acquired by, by their fall from obedience. Such is the opening of the eye which has requited, I think I said that right, such is the opening of the eye which has requited their wrongdoing requited they now take a notice that their guilty persons are exposed to view and they shrink from the glance of every condemning eye so the thing that came from that this made me think am i ashamed enough of my sin i'm often not sometimes my repentance and asking of forgiveness is apathetic and smug that was my reaction to that um the reaction that Adam and Eve had when they, after that first sin, their eyes are open to their shame and their guilt and they wreck and, you know, and they understand like how truly wretched they were. Their reaction was, uh, was, um, just total guilt. I mean, just this consuming guilt that they, they, they absolutely had to be, uh, made right again. Um, and so my, my reaction to that, my que the question that I asked myself was, was, is my guilt strong enough for my sin? Do I feel guilty enough of my sin? And I would say oftentimes I don't. Um, oftentimes it's, it's just kind of this apathetic, oh man, I sinned again. Sorry, God, please forgive me. Where it should be just, <clears throat> I think we've, we've probably all had times where we committed like a really bad sin and, it, and we truly did experience just true sackcloth and ashes remorse yeah yeah like psalm 51 level remorse mm -hmm. um but i I, th I think i should feel that every time and i don't and uh, so that's something i think that's an area i need to grow in is is feeling truly remorseful for for sin i agree with that i agree with that from from my own perspective i think that 
there are moments. Get closer. There are moments where it's just like I'm completely broken mm-hmm. based on what I've done. And there are moments where I just go through this rote obligation of saying I'm sorry after committing a sin. Mm-hmm. I think that I get, and this is just me personally, because I because I do know some of the Bible, sometimes I'm more fearful of losing the blessings of God because of my sin than I am about sheerly being disobedient or, I don't know, sometimes I'm more focused on the blessing. I'm going to lose the blessing. Yeah, I'm going to lose the promises. I'm going to lose this or I'm going to lose that. And I think that that truly reveals in me that I'm there's still a lot of selfishness in here and I recognize that but I do also hold to and I'm I'm kind of a literalist when it comes to the Bible okay. I, I'm going to be op- <clears throat> I'm going to be open about that I believe most of it is literal mm-hmm. now there are some metaphorical things that are described in scripture and uh, I'm not 100% clear on a lot of that stuff. Some of the book of Revelation, I was like, what in the world is it talking about? But I think these things will be prophetically, literally fulfilled. Mm-hmm. So if it tells me that there's a blessing that's attached to this particular act of obedience, then I want to try to do that because I want the blessing. Mm-hmm. But if he attaches a blessing to it, then it's available. It's like if I go out and I practice sprints every day and I've been given the promise, if I do this, then I'm going to win a state championship. Then it's my responsibility whether I go out and do the work every day. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same thing with this. It's just like I do not see a New Testament commandment of – I'm using this example. Yeah. I do not see a New Testament commandment of tithing. tithing. Mm -hmm. But I do see some principles that are in place all throughout Scripture, minus the Mosaic Law. If we look at Abraham, we look at Jacob, which were hundreds of years before Moses brought in the Mosaic Law. And then you look at some principles in the New Testament. You know, Jesus says, you do right by tithing, continue to do that, but you've neglected these things. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, that was before the New Covenant was ratified because the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus had not happened. But then there's some things in Acts and 1 Corinthians. There's a lot of different things that it kind of alludes to. Well, I think think anything Jesus taught before his death and resurrection qualifies. I mean, he he was inaugurating the— the the new covenant so yeah, i don't i don't think it's invalidated at all just because it happened before no but we're not under the law anymore and i think that right. that definitely tithing was definitely something that was under the law mm-hmm. because you only see really one instance of abraham given to melchizedek it's not like he, he it didn't seem like he did that every payday mm-hmm. but at the same time it gives you that example so we have to we have to take it in light of that example is there but when you look at Malachi, which is such a used passage of scripture, it says that he will protect you from the devourer mm-hmm. or the destroyer. Obviously, I think that's talking about agrarian cultures. I mean, he's talking about farming, he's talking about agriculture. But I do think that I do think that there's protection. Yeah. I agree. do think that there's protection available if you're in obedience to the scripture. I, it, 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 Jesus also said persecutions, tribulations, all those things will come. But I think that from a literal standpoint, it's kind of like alms, first fruits, seed, and you get a lot of prosperity teachers that are promising all these blessings. If you do this and if you don't do this, you're not going to have this. <laughs> it's like that's really up to God. Mm-hmm. It's my responsibility to be obedient to Scripture. It's his responsibility to fulfill the blessings. I can't be mad at him if the blessings don't come because he's not on my timeline. Mm-hmm. He's not on a timeline. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Yeah. And he's I mean, God. He can yeah. Do. He's God. It's his money. He can yeah. do what he wants. I mean, it's, it's all his. And that's, that's kind of, so my view on tithing uh, as an, as a new covenant Christian <clears throat> is, uh, so tithing 10, giving 
was is an Old Testament under the law. That was what they were required to do. So Jesus did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. So if we look at the way Jesus, uh, I'll say, expands on the law and applies it to us now under the new covenant, uh, this is kind of the flip side of the coin, but if if you even look at a, lo- a woman with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. If you uh, hate your brother in your heart, then you've committed murder in your heart. Um, so Jesus kind of takes the law and raises the bar. So I think tithing... Giving 10% is an Old Testament, old law uh, principle. But what Jesus does to the law is he, I think we, he's, he requires much more. So just like that song, Give It Up by Stephen the Levite, um, give all that you have. Now, obviously, you have to be a good steward of your money. If you give every cent that you have to the ministry, you can't pay your rent. Um, but I think, I think just kind of for myself... 10% is a good place to start, start, <clears throat> and then I would like to grow from there. I would like to go up from there because I think we're required. I think Christ wants us to uh, uh, give all that we can, time, yeah, sure. money, resource, everything, and, and to go much to go beyond 10%. Yeah, I think so. it's – I mean, there's scriptures all throughout. And, and the Bible talks a lot about money, mm-hmm. a lot about money. I mean, obviously, the scripture that a lot of people are going to go to is like, they, they'll say money is the root of all evil. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not what it says. Mm-hmm. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I heard somebody misquote that like three days ago. Well, there's so many misquotes that we talk about all the time. He's a jack of all trades and a master of none. Well, that's not the quote. What's Be the quote? a jack of all trades and a master of one. Oh. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference. You know, be really good at one particular thing, but you need to have a little knowledge in everything. Mm -hmm. So I think that the same thing when we start looking at Scripture, don't bend it. Now, obviously, when we look at alms, uh, according to Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4, you know, alms is not tithing. They're not the same. Alms is, is alms is basically giving to the poor. Okay, yeah, it's and mercy, that, mercy giving type mm-hmm. of. Okay, yeah, so, it's compassion. Yeah, yeah, it should be motivated out of out of compassion for okay. your fellow man. Mm-hmm. And I think that he said in a, a couple spots. Number one commandment: love God with everything you got. Yeah. Number two: love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that when we say we put God first, and He's the last item on our budget. That's a contradiction. Yeah. That's a contradiction. Mm-hmm. It's like if he's first, then he needs to be first. Now, I'm not saying that it's a new can, new com, new covenant, New Testament requirement or commandment or law, but at the same time, he should be somewhere on your budget. Mm-hmm. And if you're going to fulfill number one, he probably needs to be at the top. Well, yeah, and, and seek first the kingdom of God. First. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's first. Yeah, it's first. It's, um. Yeah, it's his, Mm -hmm. all of it. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of from a literal standpoint, I think that I take the Bible literal. When we look at Malachi 3, he says he'll protect you from the devourer. If you give alms, um, according to Proverbs, it says when you give alms, the return of exchange there, if it's about return of exchanges, when you give alms. One to one. One to one. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it seems pretty clear. It's just like you're not going to get rich by giving alms. Well, and I, yeah, I think if your motivation in giving to the kingdom is to get rich, I think you're starting off in a bad spot. I mean, yeah, yeah, change your, change your motivation. Yeah, I think it's love for love for God mm-hmm. in His glory. Yeah, and the desire to see His kingdom advance. Yeah, and compassion for your fellow man. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's been taught so wrong, including myself, when I first came into ministry. Is don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing, and I was applying that to tithe when it's really only applicable to alms mm. because it hurts the dignity of the person who needs. Mm. Oh, Joe, he, he gambled all his money away again. I had to bail him out again. It's just like, well, you ever seen, you ever seen kangaroo Jack? I don't know. It's there's a roll the clip. There's a clip in there of him. He does that. Don't let your, or right. show him this hand. Don't let him see this hand. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm. <laughs> Those are all my talking. I, is sin is all sin equal? Oh, that was. What uh, we're but I I didn't study it at all, so we can talk about that next week if we want. Yeah.
Yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not polished up on that. I I do not think that all sins are equal. I think, based on Scripture, um, blaspheming in the Holy Spirit that seems to be. It is, the unforgivable sin. Unforgivable sin, mm-hmm. and in First John, it does talk about sins unto death. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there, we'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> We didn't even do a question of the week. Let's do a question of All the right, week. All right, let's do it. I need to I need to get some more. Um I'd like to these are all pretty pretty significant theological topics. A lot of times I'd like to get some Something a little lighter. Yeah. Just to just to mix it up. What was Garfield's friend the dog's name? I don't know. Odie. Odie. Odie, Odie, Odie. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Uh, this is a on topic. <laughs> How do I mortify sin? I think loving God, coming to love God, is is an extremely important step in that. Probably first step. Um, How do I mortify sin? So Timothy Brindle has a lot to say about that. There's he has an album. In fact, I think it's my favorite album of his. Uh, called Killing Sin. It's got a really cool album cover. Um, and the, there's a song on that album called Killing Sin. That has some helpful points. Thomas Watson uh, has the doctrine of repentance. Somebody, I think it's also Thomas Watson, The Mortification of Sin is another book. Mortification of Sin. John Owen. John Owen. Yeah, the, it's another one of those uh, pa- of paperback, paperback Puritans. Uh, it's like, it's probably like a hundred, 150 pages long. It's probably a short little book. Um, the mortification of sin by John Owen. So those are some good resources to study that some more. I think the Didn't Proverbs, really answer, Proverbs chapter one, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, King of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction and in wise dealing and righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. I think the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I think it starts with knowledge. I think, number one, you have to recognize that whatever the sin is, is sin. And then there will be a desire to mortify or abstain from that based on based on the revealed will of God uh, aka bible well and just from that scripture i'd say the first first step is the fear of god fear fear of the yeah it's, i think it i mean the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge uh, i don't think that until you've been given eyes to see and ears to hear there won't be a desire to do it but once you have been i didn't really give an answer yet but once you have been given that how do you mortify sin it's like okay now i'm on board Sin is bad. I need to be obedient. How do I mortify sin? Like, what, practically speaking, how do you, uh, as Timothy Brindle would say, how do you kill sin? Run, abstain. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't think toy with it, play with it. Mm-hmm. Don't wrap it up in a nice box with wrapping paper and a bow, um, because there's going to come a point in time where it's just like it's been sitting under the tree, and now it's March. <laughs> and you've abstained since December 25th and you, you open it and it's just like, Oh, if your Christmas tree is still up in March, then you've got other problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. More mortification of sin. That's a, that's a good question. I would, huh. I would say re- renew your mind through the word and run from it. I should have, I should have been here already. Ephesians six. Or is it four? Ephesians four. Armor of God. Six. Six. That's what I thought. Armor of God. Put on the full armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's a picture. That's a, that's a. Therefore, take up the full armor of God that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm, stand for, firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with the truth to knowledge, mm-hmm. 
having put on the breastplate of righteousness, obedience, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Hmm. Help me expand on that one. I wonder if the breastplate of righteousness is you overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. I think that return to your first love. I think that you have to go back to it. Just like, I almost think that you have to go back to the starting point. It's like, I've been forgiven. Mm -hmm. I've been forgiven. And I think that that's where, because he says your righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. And that only comes through faith in Christ. Um, I have a different understanding of that. Which part? Scripture. That um, the exceeding the right. exceeding the righteousness of the Pharisees. I've always thought that was not the goal to be obtained, but that he was basically it was a it was an unreachable goal. Um, it to it was separate from. So, I my understanding of it is without Christ. If you if you want to try to do this under the law, then you have to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. But if you want to do it with, if you're going to do it in Christ, then then that's not necessarily the goal. But anyway, um, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Um, what does shod mean? S H O D. I think it's uh, you shod horses. You put their hor you put their horseshoes on shod. They get shod shod that's not in the oxford dictionary shod. how are you spelling that s-h-o-d that's the way it's spelled in there shoe yeah i think you're just putting shoes on oh shod is the past tense of shoe is that They're right yeah. what that's it's weird. That's a concept I don't know. Past tense of shoe. What's the future tense of shoe? <laughs> Sheed. <laughs> <laughs> Sheed shoe shod. Um, you ought to get a shirt with that on there. It does uh, get a lot of questions. Shoe. Verb. This is Google. Definitions from Ox Oxford languages. Past tense shod. Past particle shod. Fit a horse with a shoe or shoes. Of a person be wearing shoes of a specific kind. His large feet were shod in sneakers. Hmm. Protect the protect the end of an object such as a pole with a metal shoe. Four wooden box were each were each shod with heavy iron heads. Okay, so anyway, shod your feet. Put on, put on put, the shoes. Put on having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I don't, I'm not getting an immediate, clear understanding of that. So put on, protect your feet with the preparation. Context. Context is vital here, I think, to understand that. Blessed are the peacemakers, <laughs> That's according to the Beatitudes. That's a different context that I meant. But he says you're not fighting against flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. So he's. I think he's maybe referencing it's just like, don't fight with your brother. You know, blessed are the peacemakers. I wonder. In my mind, those are two completely different contexts. Could be. Well, I mean, the, that's a, where is that in? Like Matthew? Matthew 5. So we're in Ephesians 6 here. I know, but context is talking <clears throat> about fighting with your brothers, right? Not in this. This is talking about, that the Matthew context is, but this is, this is a spiritual warfare context. You're not fighting against flesh and blood. So basically, you're not fighting. Against, I'm not fighting against you as a human. There's something happening. Well, when you say brothers, though, it's I would that to me that's Christians and Christians. Yeah, uh, you're not fighting against flesh and blood. To me, is uh, like when an example is when you're persecuted by unbelievers. Bless they're you. they're not your true enemy. Your true enemy is is in the spiritual realm. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think those. Yeah, are... maybe not. <clears throat> I'm trying to understand though. The preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? The preparation of it. I don't, I'm not. Uh, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. So righteousness, un knowledge, un the fear of God, which then leads to knowledge of the truth. And righteousness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, whatever that means. 
Faith is the shield that extinguishes all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. So I think to mortify sin, ah, uh, the kill sin, the sword of the the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So I think the word of God is a huge part in killing sin because it's one thing, it's one thing to resist temptation, you know, just by, oh, I know I'm, I'm, I know I'm not supposed to do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. You know, sit there and, and to be determined, I'm not going to do this, but then to pull out the sword and, and quote scriptures to yourself mm-hmm. um, is, I think is, is a way to, get off a of defense and, and get on offense and, and to start to start to mortify, mm-hmm. to kill sin uh, within yourself. So I think scripture, that that's my answer. How do you mortify sin? I think scripture is, is uh, the sword that you use for offense to, you know, all the other pieces of the armor of God are defense against sin. You're just resisting and, and you're, you're able to, to withstand temptation and, and evil. But then to more to go in and kill it to now I'm switching to offense and I'm attacking the sin. I yeah. think the word of God is the way to do that. I think having scriptures. I think, definitely it's, the, I, I think it's the I think it's the word. I think that Proverbs one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Mm-hmm. I think that. I think that once you get eyes to see and ears to hear, I think that you get in the word of God and it's just like you're equipped with the rima. I think the word used there is rima, and that's where you get like rima. It's that. I don't know that it's necessarily that long sword. It's that sword that's a little shorter when you're in hand-to-hand combat with the enemy. Like a dagger or longer than a dagger? I, I don't know exactly. Probably probably somewhere kind of, in between. Probably kind of like Sting. Yeah, 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 like Sting. I would. That, I was, that's a great picture. I was wondering if you'd get that reference. That's a great picture. I, I think that link, that's just like picture. you're able to really wield it really well. And you're able to wield it really well because it almost is like an extension of you and it's been written on your heart. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I'm more than a conqueror. Greater is he who lives in me than he who lives in the world. Uh, you know, just like just there are certain scriptures that you just resonate with. Yeah. And you can use those in hand to hand combat against the enemy and you would recite those scriptures. And I think that if you resist, if you resist the devil, he will flee according to scripture. But I don't think you can resist the devil without scripture. Mm-hmm. I think if you try to resist the devil with philosophy, he's going to cave your head in. And I would also, I would add, just add to that with a good understanding of scripture because yeah. Satan a lot of times will use oh, scripture. Twist it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think yeah, not only with scripture, but have a good understanding of of scripture. Yeah, and I think that I think that in those moments where we're truly attempting where we're truly attempting to fight out of faith, knowing that this is what I should do, I think that the Holy Spirit will will help you. I think the Holy Spirit will help you in those moments. He'll bring to remembrance passages of scriptures that are in context to what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that if he started a good work in you, he's going to complete it. So I think that when you get into those combat situations, I think God knows your heart. Yeah. I mean, he knows you're trying to fight. He'll help you. Mm-hmm. Call, I mean, cry out to him. I'm looking at the lyrics of Let's Kill Sin by Timothy Brindle to see if it, see if it helps. Our new birth was purchased by holy wrists, but now he's concerned by our own personal holiness. Yet we're proud and arrogant. How dare us when he's given us himself for undefiled inheritance anger and jealousy that shouldn't be found in christians just like slang in a spelling bee sluggardly laziness that shouldn't be named among us just like the just like nuns on the dating list we used to fuss oh we used to fuss obscene dudes who cussed but now we flee youthful lusts pursuing purity and faith love and peace grace from our speech saints we hug and greet. We're using courtesy. Satan's our rival, and he's smart. Take up your Bible and be sharp to amputate the idols in our in hearts and be wise and surely hide his word inside so that when, you, when you're tempted, you don't sin against him. Sow to the spirit. Don't sow to the flesh by listening to inappropriate lyrics, but stay on your face in prayer and take, and take your care to the Father and give him thanks and praise him there. 
stay accountable and well-equipped, surrounding your soul with bountiful fellowship. The only son is patient. He gives grace when we're in need so we can overcome temptation. Every night, our defense is the whole armor of God. Let's live a life of repentance, running away from sin because there's infinitely more pleasure in Christ, so give all your praise to him. That was verse 3 of Rhymes of the Remnant. Well, Turn Kyle. to page 394. You didn't have your headphones on whenever I did that, so you missed that part. But oh, I missed it. I missed it. But I, it was whenever I did the Starsky and Hutch quote where he says, uh, you saying that. this next tune is number eight on the charts, but number one in our hearts. <laughs> and I think on the movie, whenever he says that, it plays the Gold Days. Is that what that song's called? Gold Days. Oh, the times that I remember. You know that song, don't you? Mm-mm. What? Okay. What were you, you were about to say something? I don't know. Oh, Christmas songs. Mm. There's some pretty, there's some pretty uh, theologically deep Christmas carols, if you will. Mm-hmm. I mean, kind of looking at those, you know, because maybe we could play a couple of those today just to kind of, since we're not going to be in service next week. Gold days? That's ain't it. Together. No, this ain't it. What is that song? I don't know. I was kind of getting into that, though. Gold days. Time What's your favorite Christmas carol? I don't think I have one. Well, I don't really care for Christmas carols, to be honest with you. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan, but if you had to pick one right now, what would it be? <sighs> Give List some off to me. I don't even... Oh, Holy Night, uh, Mary, Did You Know, Away in the Major. <laughs> I, saw, I saw a thing the other day of, of Mary, Did You Know, and it so it asks a bunch of questions that, oh, Mary, Did You Know? And uh, somebody put up a thing that said, <laughs> it said to... Uh, just to just to answer boy. just to go ahead and answer these questions for you so to save time and then he put like no 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 yes yes no no yes 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 no no so, <laughs> so that, that's awesome as you went through the song so i mean <laughs> silent night we three kings we three kings is a band <laughs> that's like it's like in, isn't it kings. or is that a, is it a song too i don't know king and country it, it, that's like uh <laughs> that's yeah, like, it's definitely a song. It's like on The Office whenever he uh, he he's he wrote down a bunch of different drugs on paper, and one of them was hookah. <laughs> and and Toby's like, hookah's not a drug. Hookah's a pipe that you smoke tobacco in. <laughs> <And he's, laughs> do you think doing drugs is cool, Toby? Do you think doing alcohol is cool? Roll the clip. Do you think that smoking drugs is cool? Do you think that doing alcohol is cool? Oh, come all you faithful. Uh, <sighs> Silent Night's pretty good, A Holy Night. Those are two different songs, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, Holy Night and Silent Night. Hark the Herald. I don't care for that one much. Um, oh, Next Week. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. So next week, uh, Keith Craig, who goes to Murray Spur mm-hmm. Church, he's going to, for the candlelight, I think he's going to come over and... Do, oh, nice. Yeah, it'll be good, I think. Yeah. I, he's got a good voice. He plays guitar well. So that was a blessing. I got to find this song and play it for you before we go. Starsky and Hutch. Gold Days. Soundtrack. I don't It's. I don't think it's called that because I can't find it, but old, not gold days, <laughs> old days. That's what it is. Big difference. Yeah. <laughs> old days, time, good times that I remember. Oh, yeah, this is it. Number eight on the charts, but number one in our hearts. You haven't heard this? Oh man, this is a good song. Maybe there's a is there an actual like lyric that stands out that would be noticeable to people? I mean, it's just like because that didn't do it for me. Uh, I don't have the lyrics here in front of me, but maybe. Hey. Just a little sidebar here. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Could uh, I, I'm, I know that we can see this. <clears throat> hmm. Could you stretch out that sweatshirt? <laughs> Does anybody else think that there is a this uncanny? This is my jolly face. It's just like you kind of look like him. I don't. Think, I don't think I look like your him. Your eyes, your nose. <laughs> oh, I think I might be related to Spurgeon probably are i probably am he's probably my 
He he died. I want to say he died on your birthday, like two years after Papa was born, something like that. Old days, good times. I remember fun days filled with simple pleasures: drive-in movies, comic books, and blue jeans. Howdy doody, baseball cards, and birthdays. Take me back to a world gone away. Memories seem like yesterday. Oh, old days, good times. I remember. Uh, days I'll always treasure. Funny faces full of love and laughter. Funny places, summer nights and streetcars. Take me back to a world gone away. Boyhood memories seem like yesterday. Nope. In my mind and in my heart to stay. Old days, darkened dreams of good times gone away. I can't believe you ever heard that song. That's such a good song. I think somebody needs to make an anechoic chamber in the Fort Smith area. <laughs> it's millions of dollars probably. I bet you could do it cheaper than that. Not, I don't think you can, I, because like those two things, I think were like two hundred bucks a piece. Really? And the, and they're they're on like the lower end of the spectrum. You can no fi- kidding. You can find you like if I were to if I were to soundproof this room, not soundproof. That's not the right term. Thousands. If, if I were to sound treat acoust- acoustically treat this room, that's the right term. It would. I would. I would to do it proper like if like where you could turn this room into a recording studio or something mm-hmm. like that i would i would ask for at least ten thousand huh so to do the anechoic chamber because i think you've got to have like concrete yeah push. like 12 inches of concrete all around you're in a box like uh it's i mean it, it's basically like a nuclear vault hmm but uh yeah let's, let's look it up the goal for a listening room is not to have it anechoic, no reflections, no reverb. So that's the definition. No reverb. Of, that's the definition of anechoic. Um, but yeah, I would ask for at least 10, 10 grand in huh. order to, to, uh, to do it properly. So to answer your question, I, I would say, Oh, Holy Night, I think would be my favorite. Which ones did I send you for today? I didn't open them yet. You jerk. I was walking to the car whenever you... You should have stopped everything. <laughs> should have dropped all the camera equipment, everything <laughs> in the middle of the road, and just... I'm going to... I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm probably not going to be able to get these downloaded today. Cheers. Um, you could have you could have sent these to me yesterday. I could have had them already. You were sick. You didn't know that. Just what? Try. You want to do all... You know how much flack I'm going to get for this? If I do all hymns by him? Well, there's two Christmas. That's what the that's what the candlelight thing's for. I think we could do two Christmas songs. We're not going to have Christmas service with people. We're like, I know. You know how you know how I feel about that. <laughs> that, no. that, that was that, that was. I know. I was being over dramatic on purpose to be funny, oh, but I, it was I it. it was also uh, I thought it, I thought it was hilarious, but um, it was all truthful too. It was truthful. So I'll, that morning we're gonna we'll record the podcast, but then I'm gonna go to our, our Oak Baptist, Oak Cliff, Oak Cliff Baptist with Juan Church. Fuerte. Yeah, I'll go there. And he said they're gonna take communion too. That's so that'll be fun. That'll be cool. See y'all. See ya. See ya.